New series we're starting today, Throwing Shade. Yeah. Throwing Shade. I'm excited about this one. Um, uh, if you don't know, Throwing Shade is a um, term uh, used. I feel like I've been teaching a lot of updated vernacular later, uh, this, lately. Um, I think we talked about FOMO a couple weeks ago, fear of missing out, um, something like that. Anyways, um, Throwing Shade, we're going to talk about that. Um, if it ain't nice, keep your mouth shut. Uh, that's what we're kind of focusing in on. You, you're going to be amazed at how much the Bible has to say about your mouth, about your words, the way you use your tongue to talk, and how you talk about people, what you say to people, all these things. It's going to be a, um, a good, good message series. I hope you'll invite some people. Uh, today, though, we got to lay the foundation. And we're talking about throwing shade. It means when you're basically using your mouth to deride someone, backbite, gossip, slander, um, hate on what they're doing. Um, that's a form of throwing shade, all right? So um, it, we're going to use our mouths for good. We're going to use our mouths to promote the good, to speak good, to be, to be builders and not destroyers. And um, uh, that's what this uh, series is going to be about. Uh, there's an encouragement station out in the lobby, actually, that you can go by, and it actually says, if it ain't nice, keep your mouth shut. There's a microphone out there, and what, what we want you to do is to go by and have somebody record you standing in front of that microphone, and I want you to pick somebody by name and encourage them on, on video and then post it to your social media, and if you can, tag those people in that video, the person you encouraged. Why? Because social media has become a place where too much shade has been thrown. Or too much criticisms, too many, too many opinions, too many people who have a phone and think they got a platform. And, and we want to take social media back and use it for good and use it to encourage people to highlight what God is doing in someone else's life. So you can do that today, and let's, let's really take over social media with that. Can we do that? And uh, you get that's out in the lobby. Do that today before you go. I want to get everybody as much as possible to do a video and just really flood flood the internet with uh, encouragement. I think that'll really, that could really help. Um, go to Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4 verse 29. We're going to start there. I got, we got to lay a foundation before we get into all of the uh, things the, the Bible has to say about your mouth and the, the good, the bad, the ugly. And I got to read this and lay the foundation today. It's Ephesians 4 and 29. Ephesians 4 29. It says, let no corrupt, say corrupt, let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth, but what is good for necessary edification, that it may impart grace to the hearers. And do not grieve the Holy Spirit of God by whom you were sealed for the day of redemption. Let all bitterness, wrath, anger, clamor, and evil speaking be put away from you with all malice. No corrupt word. Let no corrupt word come out of your mouth. No corrupt word. Father, open our ears, make us ready to receive your word today. We thank you for the opportunity to be hearers and doers of the word. In Jesus' name, amen. Can you look at your neighbor and tell them my title of this message? Um, and, and I'm giving you permission to do, give some ferociousness behind it if you want. Y'all look, look at your neighbor. There you go. And just look at them and say, hey, hey. watch your mouth. Watch your mouth. If you're taking notes, that's the title of the message today. Watch your mouth. Uh, at some point in your life, maybe today, um, you've had somebody might have said this to you. Watch your mouth. And I don't know if you realize that when you say it, if you point at them, it adds more emphasis, right? <laughs> watch your mouth. Like you can't, it's like you almost can't say watch your mouth without pointing at the mouth. Like what does that do? Anyways, watch your mouth. And uh, maybe, you know, again, you, you might have said this to a, a loved one, <laughs> to a classmate, to a friend, uh, I don't know, but, but uh, at some point you've said to somebody, I'm sure, hey, watch your mouth. To insinuate, hey, you go any further, we're going to have problems. If you keep talking the way you're talking, there's going to be some issues. Watch your mouth. I grew up in a household that believed in discipline. They did not spare the rod. Um, I love my parents, and uh, thank God for those teaching moments, Keisha, because there were many of them. More for my older brother, not me. I learned from his, his ways and, and knew how to navigate. <laughs> we'll call it that. 
I do remember, though, moments when I talked back. You remember those? You talked back. Don't shake your head no. You talked back before. Don't, you ain't no angel. When you talk back. And uh, I remember a couple encounters, Mom. You'll probably remember these. I'm so glad you're sitting here on the front row. Um, <laughs> I remember these encounters where I would talk back to my mom, say something smart alecky, you know what I mean? Something that was just, you know, just whatever. My mom had a method that would correct that real quick. And she would take me in the bathroom, I remember vividly, on 606 Old Perry Road. In the bathroom. She'd take me in there, get a bar of soap, put it right in my mouth. Clean bar of soap, praise God. She would take this bar of soap, put it in my mouth, let me sit there for five minutes. You remember that? I love you. <laughs> Anybody else had the bar of soap treatment? Otherwise known as a torture method. Yeah. See, I, I, grew, up, we, I grew up in a little bit of a country house, and so we, it was either belts or soap. Which one you want? Um, and so she took this soap, and I had to sit. I remember she... I had to sit on the toilet seat, just sit there, just, just bar soap in the mouth. Because she wanted me to remember you can't talk to me any old kind of way. You're not going to just say what you want up in here. In this house, you do not, I don't care what the government tells you, you do not have the right to free speech. <laughs> not in this house. In this house, this is my kingdom. how I was raised. I was raised to watch my mouth, to not just speak to adults any old kind of way, to not just speak to anybody any old kind of way. And, and, and I, it taught me so well because when I would want to, to, to kind of snap back again and be all, you know, smart mouth and stuff, I'd remember that taste of that soap, you know, just in my mouth. I was like, I don't, I don't, want, I don't want to do that again. And it taught me I had to watch what I say. I think a lot of Christians could use some spiritual soap in the mouth uh, today. And I think this series is going to be the proverbial soap in the mouth treatment. If you'll give yourself to it, God can do a work through our mouths. If we'll give ourselves to it and say, God, I want you to touch my mouth. And I want you to take this tongue of mine and be not, not be something that just lets anything come out, but be somebody with self-control that doesn't deride somebody, that doesn't backbite somebody, doesn't slander, doesn't put down, doesn't hate, and doesn't say anything evil. Let no corrupt word come out of my mouth. We're going to put some soaps in some mouths today. <laughs> There's such a difference between the first and the second experience. There's this little difference. I don't know what it is. Maybe you're all depressed because the Super Bowl is, uh, don't have the Falcons in it. Maybe that's why. I know I am. Let no corrupt word come proceed out of your mouth. Let, can we, let's just break this down. I'm going to give you some principles here in a moment, but let's break down Ephesians 4.29 just for, to get rolling. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. The first two words that jump out to me is let no. Let no. Let no. That automatically tells me I have control over what I say. I control what comes out of my mouth. Everything that filters up into your brain does not need to come out of your mouth. Let no. The devil didn't make you do it. Okay? Let no. That means I have, I have, I have control. I, I can control what I say out of my mouth and what comes out and what words are said and the tone it is said in. I can control that. I, it's nobody else. I'm not putting off that responsibility on no one else. In fact, Say this out loud. Say, my mouth is my responsibility. And then it goes on to say, let no corrupt word. Corrupt, the definition quite simply means to change from good to bad in morals, manners, or actions. To change from good to bad in morals, manners, or actions. That tells me that my words were always intended to be used for good use. My words were never intended to be used to talk badly about someone, to speak evil, or to speak death. My mouth and my words were always intended to be used as good. Because if something gets corrupted, it goes from a good state to a bad state. So my words were intended to be in a good state when they exit my mouth. 
Let no corrupt word then proceed out of whose mouth? Your mouth, not your neighbor's mouth. I can't control what words come out of your mouth. I can't control what you say. I'm not taking ownership for what you say out of your mouth. In fact, if your mouth gets me in trouble, I'm going to distance myself from you if every time I'm around you, I got to knuckle up and get ready to fight. Because I'm not going to let your mouth affect my atmosphere. I'm not responsible for what you say. It's what words come out of my mouth. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. But then it continues, but what is good? For necessary edification that it may impart grace to the hearers. Only what is good should come out of my mouth. Only what is right, pure, and noble should be coming out of my mouth for what purpose? For edification. Edification. Edification coming from the word edifice, which means building. And so when I edify, when I, when I prophesy, the te- definition for prophecy in the Bible to prophesy is, to, uh, for, is for edification, encouragement, and comfort. And so when, I, when I'm edifying someone, when I'm building someone up through my words, in a, way, in a way, I'm prophesying. I am comforting them, I am encouraging them, and I'm edifying them. I'm building up the edifice of who they are. I'm building up their mentality when I speak life into their thinking. I'm building up their heart when their heart has been broken and they need it mended. I'm speaking life into their body uh, when they are sick. In fact, the Bible says in Proverbs that, it's, that his word brings healing to my bones. One of the best things you can do if you're dealing with sickness is declare the word of God over your life because it's his word that brings healing to my bones. It's his word. And so I have to understand that I am responsible for the words that come out of my mouth. I'm responsible. They can't be corrupt. They can't be something that, that, uh, can, can, that I use to twist and manipulate. No, that's not my job. Our words were meant to be connectors and not destroyers. If I could give you a physical imagery, your words are bridges. Your words are bridges that connect things. Your words are bridges that connect things. Say, my mouth is a connector. Your mouth is a connector. I'm sorry, I'm a, I'm a uh, responsive preacher. I, I have you talk a lot while I'm preaching because I want you to get this in you. My mouth is a connector. It's, it's a bridge. And so uh, I have to remember that my mouth can connect things. My mouth connects me with people. Your mouth connects you in relationship. And so, so I think this will help a lot of our relationships if we really practice and really apply this stuff and don't just let it pass over one ear out the other, but we really, really dig into it. Write down this first truth. You ready? A clear connection is God's plan. A corrupt connection is the devil's plot. A clear connection is God's plan. A corrupt connection is the devil's plot. Did you know God has a plan? His plan all along was to connect with you and I. His plan all along was to connect, watch this, the spiritual to the natural. God's plan is to connect the spiritual to the natural. He's always wanted to connect the spiritual, the kingdom, to us here in the natural. In Genesis 2, verse number 7, he starts to create, and he says, let us make man in our own image. Let us make man in our own image, in our image, Father, Son, Holy Ghost. Let us make man in our image. And what does God do? He takes dust and he breathes, the Bible says. It says says, he breathed life into man, making him a living being. So God takes who he is, breathes it into us as mankind so we can become a living being. If you translate that phrase living being and the literal, literal phrase of the word living being there literally means speaking spirit. It means speaking spirit. You know this, but we as human beings are the only creatures on the planet that have the ability to verbally express the emotions, our hopes, our dreams, our thoughts, our fears, our desires, our passions, how we feel. We are the only creatures that can express those things verbally. Animals can send signals to one another, yeah, but we as humans are the only ones that can activate our tongues to communicate language where other, someone else can understand. We are the only creatures that have that ability and capacity. Why? Because God wanted man to be an image of himself. 
He wanted himself in the earth. He wanted himself in the earth so much that he gave us his breath to be able to speak, to to communicate with. Why? Because he is a connector. And God wants to connect the spiritual to the natural. And when he wanted to connect the spiritual to the natural, he put himself in dirt and made us. I'm a speaking spirit. I have the ability to communicate. So if God then, and we see in Genesis where he creates and he says, let there be light, and light happens. God says, light! And guess what shows up just by him saying the word light? Sun, moon, stars. All these things show up at the word light coming from God. That's all God had to say was light. The rest, they had to figure out how to, how to come together. He just said light and boom. Can you imagine that? And so he goes through creation Speaking, let there be, let there be. And as he said, let there be, it became into being. In other words, when God spoke, things got built. When God spoke, things were built. So what do you think you and I's job is on the earth when we speak, if we're going to reflect our heavenly father, when we speak, things should get built, not torn down. Things should be created and not torn down. People should feel better when I speak to them. People should feel uplifted when I speak to them. People should have their lives transformed and built up in Christ simply by coming into contact with somebody like you who has hope on the inside and builds them up with their words. Let no corrupt word proceed out of your mouth. God builds when he speaks, and he wants the same for you and me. He wants us to build. Why? Because he is a connector. And so when sin came into the earth, and sin created a gap, sin created a gap between us and God. And so when there was a gap of sin that separated us from God, what did God do to connect the bridge and make a bridge come to, into place in order that we might come back into good standing with him and live a life for him and connect back with him? What did God do? The answer is in John chapter 1. In the beginning, the Word was God, and the Word was with God. Then you scroll on down to verse 14 and we find the answer of how he connected the spiritual to the natural and how he connected and how he closed the gap of sin. It says that same word that was in the beginning, it came down and it became flesh and it dwelt among us. Why? Because when God wanted to connect with man, when God wanted to heal man, when God wanted to deliver man, when God wanted to set free mankind from the sin and bondage of slavery, he sent his word to do the job. He sent Jesus down in the form of flesh and said, I want to connect the spiritual to the natural because I want my people to know their job is not to go from spiritual to natural, it's to go from the natural to the spiritual. And so I have to learn how to walk by the spirit. So I got to send my word to teach my people how they ought to walk by the spirit and not by their flesh. Because when they start to walk by the flesh, the gap begins to come distance again. But I got to send my word so I can connect them to me. His word came down. When God wanted to connect with us, he, had, he spoke. He sent his word to do the connecting for us, to bridge the gap. The spiritual became natural, so the natural could become spiritual. One theologian said, God became like man so man could become like God. The spiritual became natural so the natural could become Spiritual. Psalm 107 verse 20 says this. It says, he sent his word and healed them and delivered them from their destruction. He sent his word and healed. It healed. My words need to have a healing capacity built into it. My words need to be something that brings healing to a situation and not increase the problem. My words need to be something that brings healing into my home, that brings peace into my home, that brings joy into any relationship that I connect to. Why? Because he sent his word. The word is alive in me. Therefore, I am a living representative, an ambassador for Christ. An ambassador speaks on behalf of the government that sends it, operating in the power of the government that sent them. And so if I'm an ambassador for Christ, the Bible says, then I'm going to speak on behalf of the government and the kingdom that I'm a part of. My question to you is what government are you a part of? Government can't heal you. The kingdom of God can. It's a clash of systems. It's a clash of cultures. 
We're in a kingdom. This isn't a democracy. We're in a kingdom, a kingdom called the kingdom of God. So when, so when politicians are backbiting and slandering each other's name, I don't get involved with that. Why? Because I operate by a, a different kind of set of standards. Oh, please don't go political. Please don't go political. Please. So if God then sends his word to connect to us, in other words, mama, the spiritual became natural, how do you suppose then we connect to him? Your mouth. Your words. Your words are what connect you to God. Psalm 100. I love that. I love Psalm 100. We say it all the time. And I quote it all the time. Why? Because it's so true. Psalm 100, verse number two, it tells me, it tells me that serve the Lord with gladness, come before his presence with what? Singing. Singing. Oh, that involves my mouth. Singing. Okay, then it keeps going. It says, know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who has made us and not we ourselves. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with Praise, be thankful to him, and bless his name. So right off the bat in Psalm 100, I'm singing, I'm, I'm giving thanks, and I'm praising. All things require an expression from the mouth. Why do you think the devil fights you so hard on your praise and your prayers? Why do you feel fatigued when it's time to seek God in prayer? Why do you feel like you don't have, you don't have to come in here when we come and gather together and you got to be pumped up, primed up, waiting for somebody to say, shout! But when I come into the house of God, when I come and gather together, I already have something in my mouth called praise, called thanksgiving. Why? Because that's the life I want to live because his spirit is in me. I don't have to be waiting, prompted, and told. I'm just a praiser by nature. Singing. Thanksgiving, praise, all things that require an expression of the mouth. That means, that means my mouth has always been meant to give God praise. I was created for praise. Right? I, I was created to give God praise. That's why I got vocal cords. That's why I have a tongue. That's why I, 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 can, I can formulate words because everything in my life belongs to God, including my words. I don't know about, I get sketched out, I don't know about you, I get sketched out by silent Christians. Silent Christians. You're a born-again believer, and yet you, don't, you, you can't be a praiser. I understand if you're new to following Jesus, it could be a little bit uncomfortable sometimes because why am I shouting? Who, you're still, you're learning. But there are some seasoned people who have been following, who have been a born-again believer for 10, 20 years that still have to be poked and prodded just to give God some praise and thanks. Hmm. I can't be around a silent Christian. If, if you and I are ever sitting on a row together and you haven't opened your mouth once, I'm getting... I'm getting all my stuff, and I'm going to stop stepping over to somebody else who, who has some, who has some, who, who wants to sit and listen to the word and elbow me. Oh, did you hear that? That was good. Did you hear what it? Oh, I'm writing that down. Oh, yes, yeah, somebody, that is good. I'm used. I'm going home with victory. I don't care if it makes sense. Come out of your mouth. Make some noise, a joyful noise. See, hearing the word of God and walking in freedom causes a reaction out of me. It causes a reaction out of me. I can't contain it. Why? Because he's filled my life with joy. Why? Because he wants me to connect with him. He wants the natural to become spiritual. He wants the natural to become spiritual. And so he gave me a mouth so I could connect to him with my praise. He, he gave me that. Uh, Psalm 100 doesn't say, you know, come into his presence singing. Enter his gates of thanksgiving and his course of praise, unless you're an introvert. <laughs> Sorry, I'm, I'm an introvert, guys. Can't do all this. Uh... <laughs> Singing out loud stuff. It's uh, kind of crazy. But let a Drake song come on on your radio. <laughs> hana, 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 hana. You just start going. I pass you at the light. I thought you was an introvert. You've got to... Travis Scott got you going in right now. I'm just, uh, you know, I hum. Hmm. Okay, I get it. 
open your mouth. <laughs> Activate those words and begin to give thanks. Express it. I'm going to sing. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give thanks. I'm going to praise. This is how you connect to God. This is creating a clear connection. And this is why the devil hates it when you pray and when you praise because he understands the power of the words you are speaking called life words and you're connecting with God. He understands the deeper your connection is with him, the harder he's going to have to fight to disconnect it. Because why? His, plan, his plot is a corrupt connection. He wants to corrupt the connection between you and God. He wants to corrupt that time you spend with him. He, he, he wants you not doing what Ephesians 6, 18 says, which says, pray in the spirit always. Pray in the spirit always. 1 Thessalonians 5, 17, pray without ceasing. Pray without, pray without stopping? How do I do that? Because many of us, which is rightly so, I encourage you to do it in your own time, get along with God. Well, sometimes you ain't going to have a closet and, and notepads to, and music. You might just have to be walking into the next meeting and say, God, please don't let me cuss these people out. I need your <laughs> wisdom. I need your self-control right now. Help me, Holy Ghost. Because I know some of you, some of you are like, Peter, you'll cut somebody. I, I get it. <laughs> I know some of you, you walk in, you, you want it to happen. Let them say another word. <laughs> you use hope in the wrong way. I hope they say something. I hope they say something. <laughs> Just loading up your ammo. <laughs> I had to do this the other day. Yesterday, in fact. <laughs> the other day. Yesterday, let me be clear. Had to walk outside. It was just one of the, you know, you know that just when the moods come on you, you know, if you, it, you know, it's just like, man, I'm around people I love, but man, if this, if they, I, just, I can't take it right now. I got to get out. I put on my hoodie, I put on my sweatshirt, and I went outside, and I just started walking. I had to go on one of my prayer walks, Dwayne. My goodness, I had to I had to get out. I had to say, God, you are gonna have to touch my mouth right now. I, this, ain't, this ain't me. This is not, I'm not going to let this win. See, that's the thing. You got to feel it and then fight against it. There's nothing wrong with feeling it. That, don't feel bad for that. You got to feel it and say, nope. <laughs> the Bible says resist the devil, not assist the devil. How do I resist him? Why? Because every time you open your mouth, he wants to corrupt the connection. He wants to corrupt the connection instead of you having a clear connection. Write this second truth down. The quality of my living depends on what I have been saying. The quality of living, your quality of living depends on what you have been saying. We had to go back to Genesis because the devil, that's where corruption came in, right? Right? In Genesis chapter 3, watch this, watch this. The, the, the God had spoke, he had spoke to, to Adam and told him, you can eat from every tree but this tree, didn't he? Why? Because blessings always come with boundaries. Right? Blessings always come with boundaries. And so he gives you a blessing, there's a boundary set. He gives us sex, he puts it in the boundary of marriage. That's why when you sin sexually and you're not married, you sin against your body. Another subject. And so he sets boundaries and says, here's the blessing, here's the boundary. You get all these trees, don't eat that one. All right? Now, we go a little further in Genesis 3. Here comes the devil in the form of a snake. He shows up and starts, what does he do? Corrupts the connection. He corrupts the connection and he starts talking to Eve. He says, did God really say? And he starts trying to corrupt what God has already put in place. He starts trying to corrupt what has already been said to twist it and manipulate it. That's all he has power to do. Nothing has changed since that day in the garden. He is still trying to corrupt your connection, and he wants to do it through words. 
If you look back in your past, if we look back in our history, which for some of us is not fun, I'm right there with you, but if we look back and we see a severed relationship, a broken, unmended relationship, I can almost guarantee it will be due to what was said and words that were spoken. The devil says, did God really say that? Eve says, yeah, he's, you know, no, actually, she says, he didn't say, uh, don't eat from this tree. He said, we can eat from all these other trees. We just can't eat from that one. Okay. Did God really say, you know, he, you know, he, and he starts whispering, starts saying, you know, he said, you know, if you eat this, you'll become like him. All these things sounds good. And we, we look at snakes as evil and I hate snakes. But the devil took the form of a snake. Why? Because Adam and Eve were surrounded by animals. He had to come as something that looked like he belonged there. He had to come as something that looked like he belonged there and wouldn't stand out. If he showed up as another dude, hey, Eve, where'd you come from? Did God make another person? He would have stood out. No, he had to come as something that looked like he was supposed to be there. And some of your greatest opportunities to backbite, to slander, to gossip, to hate on somebody else, to lie, to do whatever, to shade the truth, to not tell the full truth, will come in moments where it looks like it's just normal. Oh, you can get away. You can get to say that. You can... You can you can add a little extra on. Anybody know what I'm talking about? You ever added something extra on to make you look better? Come on. Y'all are so holy. My God, we should be having revival. <laughs> it's going to be so easy. And he corrupts the connection. And the Bible says something interesting. It says she took and ate the fruit and then gave some to her husband who was with her. When men stay silent, homes can be destroyed. Adam was with her. He wasn't off in the... Di he was with her and yet was mute. There's too many mute men... And they need to find their voice. It's time, men, we find our voice and start using our words to build, to praise, to sing, to edify, to build up, to comfort. Are there any men in the room that got a voice that could take about 20 seconds and say, yes, I'm a man, hear me roar. Come on, make some noise if you're a man. Give God some manly praise in this house. I don't understand why all the men ain't standing up. What y'all doing? That's your cue, men, to stand on your feet and open your mouth and stop being silent. The devil hates when men praise. The devil hates when men pray. The devil hates when men go after God with everything in them. Why? Because he knows breakthrough is coming. Strongholds can be broken. Why? Because I still believe the husband is the head of the household. And when the husband covers his home in prayer, the devil becomes weak and he can't slither in some kind of way. Why? Because the husband and the man is standing guard. Stop staying silent, men. It's your turn to speak up. It's not an embarrassment. You gotta, oh, I let the women, they clap and they shout. That's what's wrong. Maybe it's hard for us men to give praise because some of us had a man in our life that stepped out and we don't know how to approach a loving father. And maybe there needs to be some healing that could take place and let God allow you to find out that, wait a minute, there is a father who loves me no matter what my natural father did. My heavenly father wants me. The quality of your living depends on what you have been saying. The quality on your living depends on what you have been saying. The devil wants to corrupt the connection. Proverbs 18, 20, watch this. Proverbs 18, verse 20 to 21. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. From the produce of his lips he shall be filled. Death and life are in the 
power of the tongue, and those who love it eat its fruit. A man's stomach shall be satisfied from the fruit of his mouth. This is for everybody who says, I just say what I feel. I keep it real. Everybody knows me. Just say what I feel. The problem with that is when you say what you feel, you feel what you say. According to this, what does it say? A man's stomach is filled by the fruit. It means my life is a picture of what I have been saying. I was, I was speaking this right here before y'all showed up. Y'all are a product of a prayer being answered. This church and what God's doing in it is a product of a prayer being answered. Why? Because I spoke it, and now I'm being satisfied from the fruit that came out of my mouth. Death. I hear somebody right now. I hear it. It's a name it, claim it, blab it, grab it message. Here we go. Here we go. No, when you understand the Bible, there are power. There's power. Death and life are in. Almost like it's inherent, like it comes prepackaged. But it's you and I that choose which direction on the road it goes down. Death and life are in the power of the tongue. What if you change the way you spoke about your spouse? Wife, what if you stop belittling everything he does? You can't do anything right. Well, what if, what if you just celebrated the fact he got out of bed? You know, just stand by the bed. You're the best getter-upper I've ever seen. You got, get out of that bed, boy. Yo, whoa, you look good getting out of that bed. Husband, stop making your wife the butt of your jokes. And call it just joking. I read a quote, jokes are a serious thing. No, what if we started to build each other up that way? What if you went up to that person nobody else likes at the office and just everybody's tears clear? You just started speaking life to them. What, would, what could change there? I'm not telling you it's going to happen in a day. <laughs> it might take a little work because it says the fruit. That means the seed had to be sown first. And some of us, that might be the problem because we're living out the fruit of a bad seed spoken from an insecure person. Someone somewhere who was too insecure to know who they were in God tried to project that same insecurity on you and you received it as truth and have been living that lie. Time to get free from that and to walk in the truth of God's word. Jesus would always speak contrary to what was happening in front of him. Little girl died, so everybody thought, but he walked in and in the midst of all of them said, she's only sleeping. She's only sleeping. And Jesus said, she's not dead, she's asleep. He, he looked at a crowd of starving people and said, I'm going to feed them. He, he, would, he would do this all the time. He would, he would speak contrary to the circumstance. Some might call it crazy. I call it living out God's word. Your quality of living depends on what you have been saying, saying. Psalm 141, verse 3 says, Set a guard, O Lord, over my mouth. Keep watch over the door of my lips. Keep a guard over my mouth. That's what we need to pray. Keep a guard. Some, just, I picture somebody just standing in front of your mouth. Nope, you ain't coming out. Nope, ain't going to say that. Nope. Getting rid of it. Get back. A final point I want to give you is stop living brainwashed and start living word washed. Stop living brainwashed and start living word washed. Jesus said this talking about fruit in Matthew 12. I told you I got a lot of word for you today. Matthew 12 verse 33. Either make the tree good and its fruit good or else make the tree bad and its fruit bad for a tree is known by its fruit. 
brood of vipers. That's what he said to some people. How can you, being evil, speak good things? For out of the abundance of the heart, the mouth speaks. Oh, there's a connection. Out of my heart, that's where these words are materializing and coming from? Tell me how you really feel. Out of the heart, the mouth speaks. A good man, out of good treasure, which tells me there's an evil treasure, of his heart brings forth good things. Yeah? And an evil man, out of the evil treasure, brings forth evil things. But I say to you that for whew, every idle word men may speak, they will give an account of it on the day of judgment. For by your words you will be justified, and by your words you will be condemned. Quick poll, show of hands. Does that freak you out? Freaks me out. That means every word I've spoken, I don't know how God keeps track. He's God. He knows every word I've spoken, whether good, bad, ugly, and so forth. He knows every single word. But he says every idle word. Idle. Idle meaning not working. Idle means it doesn't do anything. Why? Because we become so careless and so frivolous with our words, we just say the first thing that pops out. But Jesus says, out of your heart is where your words are coming from. Yeah? If I, can, if I listen to you for five minutes, I can locate what part of life you're in. You listen to locate. Why don't you listen to yourself? You might be able to locate yourself. Listen to what you're saying. You might be able to locate where exactly you are in life. That bitterness, that unforgiveness, that resentment that you haven't given to that person or for that situation, it's, and it's still sitting there, that's coming out in the way you talk. You can try to hide it and dress it up all you want, but it's like putting makeup on a pig. You can, you can try to cover it up, but eventually that venom's going to come out. It might not be about that person or that, about that thing, but it's going to come out in how you view other people as well. I'm not going to live brainwashed. That's this culture of this world that tells us that. The culture of this world. I wonder what would happen in elections if politicians, like, encouraged each other. You're such a great leader, man. They got to the debates. They're, they're, they're really a great leader, guys. And they've done a great, they got a beautiful family. They're great. And just changed it. That, what would happen, I wonder? But instead, everybody's trying to dig dirt up on everybody. No. I'm not going to live brainwashed. I'm going to live word washed. Word washed. Word washed. I need my heart to be cleansed. I need my, the, that, that's where the connection comes from. All of this, this foundational piece has come down to the heart. What the heart is full of. Of. The theme of my heart is dictating the rhetoric, my language. Word washed. Ephesians, let me read you this. Ephesians, verse number five, or chapter five, excuse me, verses 25 to 26. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loves the church. Love the church. Who is the church? We are the church. This building is just sheetrock and metal beams. You are the church. Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for her that he might sanctify and cleanse her with the washing of water by the word. Now, yes, I'm talking about marriages, but this applies to every relationship. That when I wash myself through the reading of God's word and the memorization and the chewing on it and the reciting and all these things, it gets in me. And it becomes the very thing that comes out of me no matter what. When I'm feeding myself this, when I'm, when I'm feeding good things into my spirit, into my heart, guess what eventually is going to come out? 
So I can stand in the midst of people who criticize and, and want to demean me, and I can still stand there with the goodness because Jesus said, turn the other cheek. All these things start flying out of my soul. Why? Because I hid his word in my heart that I might not sin against him. I've hid his word. That means I've buried it, almost like a seed. That way when the fruit comes out, Guess what's coming out? It's going to be the fruit of what I buried deep down in me. Some of us got a belly full of bitterness. We got a belly full of resentment, a belly full of failure. And that's all you can talk about. That's all you can speak about. But today, God wants to heal that heart because it's affecting your mouth. Husbands, love your wives. Just as Christ gave himself up for her, for the church by the washing and the cleansing of the water of the word cleansing um, Jesus loves us so much he, he gives us his word that cleans us that cleanses us just get it just think about that for a moment it, it is his word that does the cleaning it's his word that that makes us whole makes us right therefore I'm righteous Ephesians tells us this about a marriage. I got some, can I give you some uh, interesting statistic that backs up this truth? And we're going, we're going to go. Would you stand to your feet? We'll close out. There was a study done. Just pay attention to me. There was a study done by Cliff Notarius of Catholic University and Howard Markman of the University of Denver. And they studied married couples during the first decade of marriage. And they found a subtle but important difference at the beginning of the relationships. They found out that among couples who ultimately stayed together, only five, watch this, out of five out of every 100 comments were put downs. Couples that stayed married, every five comments out of every 100 were put downs. But among couples who later got divorced and split up, 10 of every 100 comments were insults. Just five more. That gap magnified over the next decade. And couples heading downhill were flinging five times more insults and cruel words at each other than the happy couples were. It increased the, the criticism, the negativity, the, the belittling, the, all these things increased. Started out as 10 every 100 comments. Turned into almost 50 comments. In their book, these researchers, they wrote, hostile put-downs act as a cancerous cell that if unchecked, erode the relationship over time. In the end, Relentless, unremitting negativity takes control and the couple cannot get through one week without a major blow up. Why? Because we're not watching our mouths. We're letting anything come out and thinking it doesn't do any damage. Like it's not affecting us. Like it's not shaping our mentality and we're conforming to a pattern of the world that is not godly. We think it's just a, a sly old comment or some small little thing. God knows exactly where it's coming from. And he can locate you better than anybody can. But I got hope for you. I got some encouragement for you. Watch this. Proverbs 15, 23. You ready? A man has joy by the power of his mouth and a word spoken in due season, how good it is. Our words are connectors. Our words, our words are builders. My words are supposed to be used to build bridges, not blow them up. My words are supposed to build bridges and not burn bridges. Isaiah 50 and 4. Isaiah 54 says, 
the Lord God has given me what? The tongue of the learned. That I should know how to speak a word in season to him who is weary. He awakens me morning by morning. He awakens my ear to hear as the learned. What's it telling me? It's, te it's telling me when you take in who God is, when you take in his word, you take in time with him, and you begin to become a praiser, and you enter in with singing, with praise, with thanksgiving, and you become a person of gratitude, and you make it a practice to be grateful to people in your life, and you comment on how great they look, how awesome they are, how strong they are, and how awesome they've been achieving that goal. When you begin to do that and you encourage, you become more like Jesus. And we become Jesus in this world. We become the salt that begins to heal wounds. My words were meant to heal, not to cut. My words were meant to build up, not to destroy. It's my mouth that needs a revival. It's my mouth that needs a transformation. Speak a word. I, I should learn how. I should learn how. How am I going to learn? His word. I should know how to speak a word in due season. That means the power of my words has power to meet people at the point of their quitting. My words can meet people right there at the point where they're about to, 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 to throw in the towel. It can meet people right at the point where they're about to give up. They're exhausted. They feel like they failed too much for God to accept them. They feel like they, can't, they haven't done enough. They, 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 they've, they've done too much. Whatever one. And, and your words have the power to meet them there. That's why the Bible says a praise shall continually be on my lips. Because what if tomorrow you go into work and there's a co-worker that comes in they've been contemplating suicide all week. And they bump into you who don't have anything good to say. But what if a praise was continually on our lips? And they bump into you. Someone who's had an encounter. Someone who's had an experience. Someone who's not just playing church. And they actually bump into somebody who's real. And they, before they left your presence, they were encouraged. Something about them lifted up. They used to walk head down, but now there's something, something is being lifted. Oh yeah, God is the lifter of my head. Why? Because he wants our attention on him. And he's going to use you. He's going to use you. He's going to use you to speak life into the broken. To speak life and healing into the hurting. To speak joy into the depressed. 